Hey guys, it is Patrick. And before you dive into this intermediate accounting lesson, I wanted you to know that you can actually download the notes for this section and specifically this lesson that you're about to watch if you head to my website at www.patrickleemsa.com or you can head over to the description link that's below and I'll put that link to those notes below where you can find them, download them, and print them, and follow along as you watch this lesson. So go do that, and here is your intermediate accounting lesson. All right, in this lesson, we're gonna go over cash versus accrual. In principle, you were introduced to this topic of cash versus accrual, so we're gonna kind of review what you should already know when it comes to the different types of ways we can take accounting data and translate it into information on the financial statement. So what I often tell students is that, you know, all the financial data that we receive as accountants are gonna be the same regardless. The question becomes is how do we classify it within our books? The journal entries may or may not be the same, but the way that we classify them in into our books will dictate whether the uh, items are classified using the cash basis of accounting or the accrual basis of accounting, which may change the way the financial statement looks. So that's what we're going to do here is we're going to review this idea of cash versus accrual when we're reporting accounting data as information on the financial statement. So the way that we organize a company's financial books can be accomplished in one of two ways. We can either use the cash basis of accounting or we can use the accrual accrual basis of accounting. Now let's take a look at each one of these. So for cash basis of accounting, this is per, uh, purely an accounting system in which is based on when cash is paid, for instance, an expense, or received, for instance, in a revenue situation. So with cash basis, we follow the cash. So the way that I think about it is, let's assume that you don't have any credit cards, which hopefully you don't, and you don't have any debt and all you have is your checking account, okay? And so you work a full week and you get paid, let's just say 500 bucks. So $500 gets deposited into your account. Because you receive that $500, you would have an increase in cash, therefore you would book a revenue of $500. Then you go out to the store and you need some groceries and so you go out to the local supermarket and then you buy $55 worth of groceries, okay? Now in order to pay for those groceries, you have to give them cash or use your debit card or if you're really old school, you would use something called a check. It's kind of like a document that looks like this and you like, right? Anyways, so you pay them with your debit card and uh, $55 comes out of your account. And because it came out of your account, $55 comes out of your account, that would be an expense, cash goes out. What's left in your account? $445. So we follow the cash. This also applies to an instance like Starbucks. So if you've ever used a Starbucks app, you have to put money on your app before you can actually use your app at Starbucks. So you take and you put $10 on your Starbucks app. So when you do that, the expense technically doesn't happen because you haven't actually used the $10. You just literally change your 10 US dollars into 10 Starbucks dollars. But because the cash has gone out, it's considered an expense. Now that's indifferent, that's different from accrual, which we'll talk about in a minute. So if cash goes out, we call that an expense, even if we haven't actually incurred the expense. We also have something called the accrual basis of accounting. This is an accounting system. Um, accounting system in which expenses are booked when incurred and revenues are booked when earned regardless of when cash is paid or received. So if we go back here to our instance of actually making $500 during the week, we might have gotten that paid a week later. So we worked the last week and then we get paid this week $500. So in the accrual basis, we book the revenue when we've actually earned it meaning that last week at the end of the week we earned the $500, we would consider that as revenue under the accrual method of $500 last week. Meaning that when we get the $500 this week from our paycheck, that wouldn't be revenue because we would have already booked it when we received, uh, when we earned it, which was the week before. So this we follow not necessarily where the happens to the cash, 
we follow what has actually been done. So what was, what did, what actually happened and did we earn it or did we incur the expense? So if we go back to our Starbucks, if we take $10 from our checking account and put that on our gift card with Starbucks, Yes, it's no longer our $10, but we haven't used it yet, therefore it's not an expense. So that Starbucks is literally just moving one asset to a different asset and we don't have an expense. When do we have an expense? We have an expense when we use that gift card at Starbucks. So uh, we book those when we've incurred the expense or we have earned the revenue. That's the difference. And we can have situations where the cash basis and accrual basis are not the same. So we have two options here. Most small businesses that don't really have accountants will use cash basis because it's very easy for them to use the cash basis. They just need to take their um, bank statement and basically do their accounting with their bank statement. Most big businesses will use the accrual basis because it gives us a better idea of what happened financially for the organization. Did they earn it? Did they not earn it? Um, what expenses did they incur? It gives us a better idea financially how the business is doing if we use the accrual method versus the cash method. Here's an illustration just to make sure that you understand cash versus accrual. Assume a company did the following sales and cash collections during these periods. So for year one, the company did 10,000 in credit sales. They collected 5,000 of that $10,000. In year two, they had $10,000 in sales, but they only they collected not only $10,000, but they collected $12,000. So assumably, they've collected some of what wasn't collected in year one. And then in year three, they had $10,000 in sales, but they collected $13,000. So that probably includes that arrest in the rest of year one. So this is asking us is to prepare the amount of revenues that will be reported under the cash and accrual basis. So again, Again, cash, we follow the cash. The accrual, we follow what actually happened. Did we earn the revenue or did we not earn the revenue regardless of if cash is received or not? So in the cash basis, we're gonna follow cash. So how much cash was received in year one? Well, in year one, we received $5,000 in cash. Therefore, we're gonna book revenues in year one of $5,000. In year two, we received $12,000. So we're gonna book 12,000 even though we only had sales of $10,000. Then in year three, we incurred $10,000 of revenues, but we only collected 13, or we say we only, we collected $13,000. So our revenues would be $13,000. Total, that gives us $30,000. So follow the cash with the cash basis. Now moving on to the accrual basis here. Accrual basis, we don't care about when we receive cash. We only care about when we've earned the revenue. In this case, in year one, we earned $10,000 in revenue. So even though we didn't receive $10,000, we still have earned $10,000. We're we have the right to collect $10,000 of revenues based on the work that we did during year one. In year two, same thing, we incurred or we earned $10,000 of revenues. So we're gonna book $10,000 of revenues in year two using the accrual basis. In year three, same $10,000. So we've got $10,000, even though we collected the $13,000, we're gonna report $10,000 in revenue. So in total here, we earned $30,000 in revenues. So again, follow the cash when it comes to the cash basis, follow what happened under the accrual basis. So let's talk about how this actually works in real life because when we look at real life, there can be some dramatic impact to the way that a company distributes dividends because they're distributing based on cash basis but they're reporting to their investors based on accrual basis. So how does that all work? Well, I've got an example of that right here. So this is the books for Realty Income Corporation. Um, it's a little bit dated here, but we, we still have, um, actually it's not dated, sorry. Um, 
Well, it could be dated depending on when you're watching this. But anyways, so we've got Realty Income Corporation. So let's give you a little bit of background about Realty Income Corporation or O as uh, they're simple. So Realty Income Corporation is a REIT, a real estate investment trust. What they do is they take investments from investors, they pull their money together, and they buy typically commercial real estate. So they buy commercial real estate all throughout the United States. When they buy these commercial real estates, then they lease these real estate properties to companies and they lease them using something called triple net. Triple net means that Realty Income Corporation will lease this property to a business like FedEx. FedEx will pay them rent, but FedEx is also responsible for three things. The rent, they're responsible for maintenance, and they're responsible for taxes, so triple net. They're responsible for all of that. And so, really, Realty Income Corporation gets the good end of the stick where all they're doing is they're collecting cash. They don't even need to do the property management of the commercial property. Now, what, is that, what does that give for FedEx? Well, that actually gives FedEx a cheaper rate on their uh, lease because they're going to take on the property taxes associated with the property. They're going to take care of the maintenance um, and, and utilities. Some would say it's really not triple net, it's four nets, but um, they're going to take care of the utilities. They're going to take care of basically everything other than owning the property and uh, having their cash tied up in that property. So that's what Realty Income Corporation do. They literally just collect rent from their corporate customers or clients. Okay. Now, if we look here, we see that if I look over here, um, I see that they pay a dividend of $2.80 per year, which represents 4.91%. Um, that just basically 280 divided by, it's not necessarily the 56.96, it was the last close, but um, $2, uh, basically 5% of their stock price. So they're paying $2.80 a month, a year in uh, dividends. The problem is, is this right here earnings per share. They're only earning $1.46 per share. So think about this for a second. They're earning $1.46 per share, but then they're paying out to their investors $2.80. So what, as an accountant, what do you think? Well, you probably think, wait, they can't afford to pay $2.80 because they're only taking in $1.46 for every share that they have outstanding. So we've got a discrepancy. So then how can they pay $2.80 when they only have $1.46 coming in? I'm glad that you had this asked this question. Well, if we look at their income statement, which this uh, 146 basically comes from, you can't see it, but it's below, we see that they've got re uh, revenues of looks like thousand millions, billions, $1.5 billion. And then they've got these expenses. They've got depreciation, interest, general administrative, property, income taxes, provision for impairment, We've got some gains and all of that. We'll, we'll get down and then we've got half a billion dollars worth of profit. But if you notice here, we have an, an expense, depreciation and amortization. Well, if we have depreciation and amortization, that would mean that that is an expense in which is not a cash outflow. Now, buying the property is, so there is no mistake there. But when we book depreciation, no cash actually leaves the business, which means where's that cash? That cash is in Realty Income Corporation's bank account. So sure, they brought in $436 uh, million, but they have, if we add this and this, they have a billion dollars in cash sitting in their bank account. And why? Because depreciation is not a cash out expense. It's a non-cash expense. So how does this all come together? Well, let's look at some of the calculations here. So net income to uh, uh, common shareholders were $436 million. Depreciation amortization was $593 million. Our positive cash flow then would be $1 billion, $30 million. That's how much cash they would have in their bank account, assumably if they've collected all of their receivables um, and paid all of their payables. So we'll just assume that that's what they do, $1 billion. The number of shares outstanding is 315 million shares. That's how many shares they have outstanding with investors, which means 
means that their per share cash flow, even though it's $1.46 from a profitability standpoint, it's actually $3.26, meaning that for every share that they have outstanding, those shares have a positive cash inflow of $3.26 um, or yeah, $3.26, meaning can they afford a $2.80 dividend? Well, if they're bringing in $3.26 in cash, they can afford a $2.80 dividend. So if we look here, the dividend per share was $2.80. Our positive cash flow based on our calculation is $3.26, meaning the company still retains 46 cents. They still retain 46 cents to run their operation just in case to make acquisitions. What does that look like? Well, 46 cents times 315 million shares outstanding gives us $146 million. Now, when we think about everything, can they afford this $2.80 a share and still be able to fund their investments? Well, they're funding it and they've got $146 million in cash still available to them. So that is a look at the cash versus accrual. We can see that, you know, this is an important topic because from an accrual standpoint, we're going to book revenues when we have earned them, expenses when we've incurred them. But from a cash basis standpoint, we're going to book revenues when we receive cash. We're going to book expenses when we paid cash. But as you can see in our example with Realty Income Corporation, that could be a little misleading because you might be going, how can they pay $2.80 when they only make $1.46? They can pay it because they've got a huge amount of depreciation and that depreciation is just sitting in their bank account. So hope you enjoyed this lesson on cash versus accrual and we'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, thanks for watching this lesson. If you enjoy what you saw, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to write something in the comment section below, like, I don't know, what's your favorite superhero? If you are looking for the next intermediate accounting lesson, make sure you click on this button right over here. And if you want to head to my website and see all of the lessons that are available, make sure you head to my website right here. Until next time, we'll see you in the next video.